Hi, welcome to chapter 37 on communities and ecosystems. Uh, this chapter begins with a nice little section on hippos. Hippos are really graceful underwater, but they eat a huge amount of material and they create a huge amount of dung every day. Uh, that dung then settles off to the bottom and it sets up this whole amazing community of organisms that feed on that, fish that feed on fish that feed on that, and the bacterial uh, repercussions of that are pretty amazing. And so this chapter is about all these interactions. If I could summarize it, it's actually about three things. It's about relationships between organisms. It's also about trophic feeding levels. And then the last thing it's about is about energy and nutrient cycling. So I better get going. Competition is when organisms are competing for the same food source. And so uh, niche is a word that I haven't really talked about much this year, but it's essentially your job in a ecosystem. Um, and, and the idea in biology is that only one species can, sh can fill one specific role at one time. And so even though you might have a bunch of birds that are living on different heights of a tree, they're each exploiting a different niche within that. Now, when organisms are, are tied tightly together, we call that symbiosis. Symbiosis means living together. And symbi symbiosis can be um, kind of shown in a couple of different ways. First of those is what's called mutualism. Mutualism is a plus plus. In other words, it's good for me, it's good for you. An example would be like in these uh, corals. Corals are animals, but they also have algae that are embedded within them. And so they have this, in, this uh, mutualistic relationship where they give the algae a home and return the algae to uh, photosynthesis and then provide them for food. So that's great for both. But sometimes that relationship is predatory. And so we can think of that as a plus minus. In other words, it's good for you, but you eat me, and so that's bad. And so camouflage, uh, this is really one of those where you have to do well and you have to compete well in a predatory relationship. And so that's where we have these ama amazing things like this is a frog's camouflage uh, to blend in, or this is warning coloration in another type of a frog, and it's essentially saying I'm filled with toxin. If you eat me, you'll die. Um, herbivory would be another one where we have herbivores feeding on plants. And so this is a caterpillar that can actually destroy uh, this type of a plant. And so what it does, uh, it's really smart, is that butterflies won't lay their eggs uh, on a plant in, in, unless it's, there aren't a lot of eggs there already. And so these are eggs that will hatch into caterpillars that will destroy the plant. And so what the plant has evolved is these sugar deposits which look like eggs and fools those uh, butterflies. Now, if you don't understand how natural selection works, this would really kind of twist your brain. In other words, how does the plant know what they see? And again, they don't have to. Don't think of them like us. Uh, any plants that had even tiny little yellow dots did better the, than, the, than those that didn't. Parasitism is another one of these relationships where it's good for you, bad for me. Um, and so these are aphids feeding on a plant. We can think of them as parasites on that plant. Second thing I want to talk about are what are called trophic levels. Trophic levels, the word trophic means to eat. And so these are the feeding levels. This would be an aquatic food chain and this would be a terrestrial food chain. And so all food chains are going to start with producers. In other words, organisms that can make their own food, but they're fed on by consumers, which are in turn can fed on by secondary and tertiary and quaternary consumers. And so we've got this kind of linear relationship here. It's called a food chain. And we lose energy along each of those as well. But that's not really how uh, a, a ecosystem is going to work. It's more of a food web. And so if we put all of those relationships or all those food chains in an area together, we get this really complex arrangement called a uh, food web. And it's hard to predict how changes to one of the parts of that is going to affect all the other ones. In other words, the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone Park has, has had these huge repercussions all the way down to uh, beaver uh, populations in the park due to less grazing, more willow. It's hard, to, it's hard to kind of figure it out before we actually do it. And so this leads to the idea of what's called a keystone species. What's a keystone species? It's a species whose control over the ecosystem far outlays its biomass. In other words, its, its, its uh, amount within that ecosystem. Maybe it's better if I kind of explain it. Oh, the word comes from keystone. In other words, if I pull out this or if I pull out this, the whole thing falls down. And so these are a type of uh, sea star. This is a study done in the 1960s. And what the ecologist did was he, he removed these sea stars, these predatory sea stars from an area. And when he did that, the mussels that they fed on went out of control. And so it threw the whole food, food web into uh, flux. And uh, after a few years, what he had done is decrease the biodiversity. So from there being 15 species in that area, there were all of a sudden five. And so the removal of just that one predator really screwed the whole thing up. Now, sometimes it screws it up to the point where life has to start over again. 
And so we call that a major disturbance. A major disturbance is when we've changed the area to the point where life has to recolonize it. it comes in two forms, what are called primary succession. A great example of this would be like a meteorite impact or even uh, more close to home would be like Mount St. Helens. When Mount St. Helens erupted, all we had left was rock. And now we have what's called primary succession. In other words, we have to establish soil. Then after we establish soil, then we can establish some plant life and, and producers bring consumers. That's pretty rare that we have that anymore. Uh, most of what we see as far as succession goes is secondary. What would that be? Like a forest fire sweeps through an area, wipes out all the trees, and then we're back to plants, which grow shrubs, which grow trees, which grow bigger trees. Uh, and in Yellowstone Park, we saw these massive fires and then we saw lodgepole pine come in and lupin, which leads to fir and spruce, and then we see this secondary succession. Sometimes, though, the whole thing gets thrown into flux because of something that we've done. And so these are rabbits that were introduced into Australia. One guy brought some rabbits so he could hunt them in Australia in the 1850s. And what that has led to is rabbits taking off. In other words, there's no natural predators, nothing to stop them, and so they've taken off all the way across Australia now. And that's an invasive species. It's something that we have introduced, doesn't have a predator there, and so it can take off, kind of out of control. The last thing, again, I wanted to talk about is energy flow and nutrient cycling. If you think of a terrarium, and so this is a terrarium, in other words, it's an enclosed glass box where we have life inside it, that thing works really well. In other words, sometimes we actually can airtight seal it, an aquatic biome, and uh, we get life just continuing on. And the reason that works is we have energy coming in in the form of light and photosynthesis, remember, produces oxygen, which you know, through respiration is consumed, which creates carbon dioxide, which can be recycled, and bacteria do all of that. But the lesson I want you to get from this picture is energy is going to go in and then come out in a one-way fashion. In other words, it eventually ends up as heat. But if we look at nutrients, chemicals within there have to be recycled over and over and over again. So like I was talking about earlier with water and the water cycle having to be recycled, that same thing occurs here. As far as energy goes, we have what's called the 10% rule. Each time we go up a trophic level, we can only move 10% of that material to the next level. In other words, you're going to have way more producers than you're going to have consumers. How does this apply to humans, this 10% rule? Well, um, if we've got one meat eater, it's going to take uh, 10 times the amount of energy to feed that one meter as it's going to be to feed vegetarians. And so uh, ecologically sound, eating meat is, I love a good steak, but uh, it's probably not the most sound way to do that. Uh, and I talked about in class, why don't we eat mountain lions? Well, mountain lions would add a whole nother level to that. And so it would just be too expensive. And then finally, we have chemical cycling. Chemical cycling, remember, isn't in one way. It's not in one direction like energy is, but it's chemicals on our planet that we have to use over and over and over again. And there are three ones that you should know for the AP exam. First one is going to be called the carbon cycle. Carbon cycle, remember, makes us. We're made out of carbon, and so it's really important that we have that steady car carbon supply. Where do we get it? Well, if you're a plant, you take it in in the form of carbon dioxide, and if you're an animal, you eat the plant or eat an animal that ate the plant. And so where is the carbon? It's inside us. Where does it stay? Well, it eventually moves into the atmosphere through carbon dioxide. Uh, when we die and, and we're broken down through decomposition, eventually that carbon goes back into the atmosphere. Um, so that's the carbon cycle. On either side of the carbon cycle, again, we have photosynthesis and respiration. Next one's called the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen cycle, we need it because remember all the proteins contain amino acids and we need the nitrogen for that. Whereas most of it sit, it sits up here in the atmosphere as nitrogen gas. It's all around me, but I can't take it in. In other words, bacteria in the ground have to fixate that nitrogen, make it available to the plants. We eat the plants, we get the nitrogen from them, and when we die, other bacteria release that into the atmosphere. And then the last one is the phosphorus cycle. We need it for ATP, we need it for nucleic acids. Where does it sit? Well, it's different. It doesn't sit in the atmosphere. It actually sits in the rocks, and it's picked up by plants. We eat the plants, and then when we die, all of those phosphates are returned back into the atmosphere. And so again, we have this chemical cycling, and that's it.